You know, sometimes we need an out of this world reminder that there is a world beyond us, many worlds beyond us, of which we uh, lack obsession, but we, we, we maybe should obsess, so they take our mind off ourselves. And one involves the planet Mars and what this Curiosity rover, like a lunar rover, but on Mars, and what it's been digging up and finding out the last six years, it's been slowly traversing the Martian uh, surface here. Uh, and NASA released some fascinating findings from the data that has come from that steady but reliable little uh, glorified Jeep, if you will. Uh, quoting from the NASA report, Curiosity has shown that the Gale Crater was habitable around three and a half billion years ago. It's a large swath of that planet, I should point out, with conditions comparable to those on early Earth where life evolved. They go on to say the question of whether life might have originated or even existed on Mars is a lot more opportune now that we know that organic molecules were present on its surface at that time. Other scientists pouncing on that said, maybe we were not alone. Maybe we are not alone. To astronaut and best-selling author Clayton Anderson. Clayton, that's a remarkable finding. And it, it might explain why we keep visiting Mars, including this next capsule that I guess is going to burrow into the planet Mars. What do you think of all this? Well, I think that uh, we as humans oftentimes are hopeful that we'll find life elsewhere in our universe. And the fact that we discovered these building blocks of life that are three and a half billion years old gives us hope. And any time that uh, a space advocate like me can point to our population on the planet and give hope for space, further space exploration, I'm all for that. You know, in, in your book, and it's a question of space, I mean, we look at the issue maybe about man's inherent need to explore and find out more, but we have been ceding that to, to many others. There's nothing wrong with a lot of people joining the same fascinating party, but we've kind of limited ourselves, not that what we're doing on Mars and a lot of these unmanned missions that are just remarkable uh, is chump change, but we're not what we were, and we don't commit what we did. What happened? Well, I think we have a lot of competing priorities these days. You know, in the Apollo time frame, two cents on the tax dollar went to the space program, and now we're less than a half a penny that goes to that same space program. So if you can only imagine if we could get it back up to the Apollo levels, how much more we might be able to do. And uh, But that's for people that are at a higher pay grade than me to decide. I didn't think there was anyone at a higher pay grade than you, Clayton. But you know, one of the things I felt was <laughs> incentivized us during the, the, the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo years were the Russians. They were our great focal point here, that, that uh, we were doing this to beat them or, or, or not to have them have the advantage. Um, now we learn that China, I guess our modern day foe, I'm not meaning to trivialize this, is exploring uh, uh, you know, space in an aggressive manner. I think recently launching a rocket that'll go to the dark side of the moon. You would think that would be reason enough for us to rethink our passive approach and maybe get moving. Well, I agree, and I hope we are. Competition is a great motivator, and the fact that the Chinese are, uh, have a growing space program today is, an, is competition. And uh, I'd actually like to really see us work together with them uh, to do some great things. Uh, I've, I'm a firm believer that if we work together in space, we don't fight each other on the ground. So that's a premise we ought to consider. Um, when Gene Cernan, the great astronaut, Apollo 17 commander, we used to come on this show so frequently, he talked about the fact that as incredible as unmanned missions were and are, and all the information we get from them were and are, including this from this rover, um, you need men and women out there, and you need them to, to be pushing the boundaries out there. Do you agree with that? Absolutely, I agree. Uh, the only way we can really, truly explore space further is with a combination of robotic technology and humans. Um, while robots can bring lots and lots of great things to the table, they can't bring that ability to assess real time and to change plans on the fly when something happens or you see something or come across something that you're not aware of. So. Uh, I think we all have to come to the agreement that it's going to take both, robots and humans. Um, we t hint and tease a lot about the possibility of life or the building blocks of life being on Mars. Now, that's relatively close in our neighborhood. I know it goes back to the Carl Sagan view that the, the, playing out just the sheer possibilities and the numbers, life is everywhere out there, is it not? 
I agree. I think that I like to tell people the universe is a huge pizza and we're on one crust and we've gone to the moon. That's it. But maybe on the opposite crust is another species doing exactly the type of things that we're doing. So in order for us to meet at that pepperoni in the middle, it's going to take time, it's going to take money, and it's going to take expertise. And we're in that early in that stage of the process. Clayton, here's what made you a great astronaut and a great author. <laughs> your analogies and taking this whole quest for, for space and relating it to something I could understand, pizza. I am in your debt and honor. All right, thank, uh, Clayton Anderson, thank you very, very much. Well, that is a good perspective, and, and it is, it's a very big pizza pie. We should look around. It's a big neighborhood.